Well, good evening and welcome. Um, most of you know I'm Allison Ames Galstad, the director here at the Coralville Public Library. Uh, this is a special day in the history of our library. Coralville Public Library began 50 years ago today with the adoption of, <laughs> yes, <laughs> with the adoption of ordinance number 187, establishing a free public library in Coralville, Iowa. So the Coralville City Council adopted the ordinance uh, in April of 1965. Before I introduce our speaker, um, uh, in recognition of the library's 50th anniversary, the city is helping us celebrate this summer. And I wanna invite Terry Kading up to say just a few words about that. Thanks, Allison. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, my name is Terry Kading and I'm working with the city of Coralville in the Fort Fest Committee. And we, as Allison said, um, we are celebrating the library's 50th anniversary. I've enjoyed it for not quite 50 years, but about 40 years mm -hmm. and enjoyed every minute of it and seen it move from facilities and additions and all that. But Fest, um, the committee decided about, this is the third year, so um, two years ago, that we're going to move towards our 150th Well, So on the 140th, we decided that every year as part of the fourth fest celebration we would celebrate something that um, has helped mold Coralville's past, um, brought us to where we are today, and helping us move forward to um, the future and look forward to the future. So this year it was a no-brainer that the Coralville Library, in conjunction with celebrating their 50th anniversary, um, we would be celebrating um, Coralville's Coralville Library, Coralville Public Library. And so the theme of Coralville's Fourth Fest this year is um, wrapped around the Coralville Library. So, um, and the actual theme is be a part of Coralville's story. Um, so, in conjunction with each of the celebrations every year, we have designed buttons. Um, this year, the button, of course, is the library. We also, the first year we did it, we recognized the um, Coralville Schoolhouse. The second year, just last year, I don't know if any of you remember the big slide that was on Highway 6. Um, that was a, a part of Coralville's history for a few years and right on Highway 6 and it, many people drove by it and remembered it. But this year we have a button um, commemorating the library's 50th anniversary. I do have those for sale out here today. They'll be for sale all summer. The proceeds, the net profit off of those will go this year. Um, the committee did decide to turn that back to the library. So um, the direct proceeds from the sale of the buttons um, would go directly back to the library. So at any time, if you'd like to see me to purchase one or if you missed the previous two years, we um, have those for sale also. So thank you and enjoy the book. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Um, I also wanted to just invite you to um, please in help yourself to coffee and cupcakes. Um, this is relatively informal, so don't worry about getting up and getting yourself a little, co uh, little snack. Um, to celebrate today's milestone and kick off the library's 50th anniversary, we've invited Tim Walsh to de debut his new book, Images of America, Coralville, which has just been released. As many of you know, Timothy Walsh is uh, Director Emeritus of the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and author of numerous books. Um, we had the distinct pleasure of having Tim right here in the library as he sorted through and scanned hundreds of pictures and images for possible inclusion in this book. And I will repeat what Tim often says, we hope that these initial historical images of Coralville that he's gathered are just the beginning of a growing collection of pictures that we can digitize and make available to the public for viewing and study. Uh, so thank you for being here. There will be books for purchase at the table and back if anyone is interested and the proceeds from those um, purchases um, here at the library go to the Library Foundation. And Tim will be available to sign books um, after his presentation and, of course, to answer questions. So please help me uh, welcome Timothy Walsh. Thank, okay. Thank you all for coming. See lots of friends and family, which is always good. And as Allison mentioned, this is a debut lecture, so a lot of little, you know, live TV, a lot of little glitches and, and problems along the way, but uh, I appreciate having a, a friendly audience. We're not, of course, supposed to judge books by their cover, but as you can see, we have a picture here of the Pearl Oatmeal, 
And if it does look sort of vaguely familiar, uh, it is a, a kind of a template cover. And you may have seen these not only at Barnes & Noble, but perhaps at uh, hardware stores and Walgreens and other uh, places wherever they sell magazines. Uh, this particular company, Arcadia, has produced 10,000 local histories of neighborhoods and cities and counties and just about every type of group. They've really done a collective service, so we're glad to have Coralville as part of this, this process. And I was approached about two years ago with the offer, would you be interested in doing a book about Coralville? And of course, just full of hubris, I thought, how difficult could it be to do a book of photographs about this dynamic community that I've known for the past 27 years or so since we've lived here, uh, thinking, of course, that Coralville must have immediately emerged as a bustling community of thousands and thousands of people who carefully collected all of their photographs and put the information on the back and deposited it at the Johnson County Historical Society. Just be ready, I could use this modern, lovely Coralville Public Library, uh, and I'm sure they would help us. Well, certainly the help was there, the enthusiasm was there, but finding the pictures proved to be more difficult because, as you probably know, Coralville was uh, incorporated in 1873, but hardly anybody lived here for the first 50 years. As late as 1920, there were only about 150 people or so in the census uh, for Coralville. So what you have is a community for the first half of its uh, 100 and almost 150 years where very few people are living and these are working uh, people. They didn't necessarily have box cameras or they didn't have uh, the leisure time and I needed at least uh, 180 pictures. I could have no more than 220. So it proved to be more of a challenge. And that's what I'm going to do now is to take you on an odyssey. Uh, not so much a personal odyssey, but a documentary odyssey of some of the pictures that you'll find in the book. I'm going to talk about 40 or so of these pictures. Uh, and as you'll hear, there are 198 pictures in the book. Uh, of about 400 that we've scanned thus far. And as we get to the end, the task will, will be for the rest of you and your friends and your uh, parents and perhaps the legacy of your grandparents to gather photographs and documents that you have of Coralville. Make sure they're carefully labeled. Uh, we can talk a little bit about how you do that so that we can add these to the database because we certainly would like to continue to, to have this collection grow as we approach, as Terry mentioned, the uh, 150th anniversary of the incorporation of Coralville in 2023, and I'm sure you're smirking to yourself, at least in your mind, saying 2023. I haven't thought about 2016 yet. Uh, but it will be here sooner than we realize. So in 2023, we will set a, uh, we, will, we will go on to the, uh, to the sesquicentennial. Well, just the basic facts. I mentioned Arcadia, which is a publisher of 10,000 histories. That may shortchange them because in an aggressive mo uh, move, uh, Arcadia purchased another company that was producing histories. They produced 3,000, the other company. Uh, called History Press, and so I think collectively this company has uh, about 13,000 titles in print. Well, our book is composed of 11 chapters, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those chapters, show you a few pictures, 128 pages. Every one of the Arcadia books is 128 pages, so it's fairly slim. It's an easy read. You can do it in a couple of hours. As I mentioned, 198 images in this book, and it was a challenge to make sure I could get a good selection across these 11 themes and chapters. And each of the photographs is accompanied uh, either in, in tandem or by itself with a longish caption of about 150 words, and all of the words total up to about 18,000 words. So that's the general dynamic of the book uh, that we have. Um, and as I mentioned, or at least alluded to, Producing a book, any book, takes a village. You know that phrase. Takes a village to raise a child, takes a village to write a book or produce a book. And I could not have done uh, this without Alex's help. Alex is there, I see her smiling, and Allison's help. And the spirit of Iowa's official, unofficial historian, as Kelly Hayworth likes to say, Rex Brandstatter is, is Coralville's unofficial historian who helped me review the captions, make sure that I wasn't making some bonehead uh, mistake in, in describing somebody or something. So I was blessed to have all three institutions. Alex shuttled all of the collections. The core of the book, 
of those 198 pictures, I want to guess that 150 or so are from the Johnson County Historical Society, and they really represent work that was done for the centennial in 18, 18, 1973 when they did Lest We Forget. Some of you may remember that book. It's a paper-bound book that was done by Fran Rogers and Pauline Lovetinsky and uh, uh, Jean Schwab uh, and others to commemorate the centennial. Well, they gathered a lot of pictures, and when the printer was done with the big negative sheets that were used, they cut up those negatives, and they eventually found their way to the Johnson County Historical Society where they were carefully accessioned, and I was able to use those. Thank goodness for new photo technology because we could clean up some of those photo negatives and produce a digitized image that's a pretty good quality uh, for the book. Uh, but I couldn't have done it without the scanning equipment. I think it was thanks to the friends of the Coralville Public Library who purchased a top quality scanner and Allison and her staff provided an office nice space right next to Laura's office there where I would scan and I think we can continue to do this so as you have photo collections particularly you have no excuse we can I think impose upon Allison and the staff to continue to use the scanner to add to that database so and then I certainly hope Rex will be with us in future presentations to talk a little bit more about uh, both the history of Coralville and uh, uh, also uh, uh, add his, uh, his own color commentary. I mentioned earlier we have, uh, what did I say, 11 chapters. Okay, so the first of our chapters is founders. Every community starts with a group of people who are determined to make something of the land. And Coralville was just uh, like any other community. I'm starting here with Ezekiel Clark, you all know. And many of you probably know that the original name of this community was Clarksville. Uh, named after Ezekiel Clark, who I like to think of as Coralville's first venture capitalist. Uh, he partnered with and actually lived with Samuel Kirkwood here in Coralville uh, and eventually sold his mill to Valentine Miller. And what you have is an interesting transition. He's not the first person to build a mill here in Coralville, uh, but he purchases a mill that just wasn't being sufficiently efficient uh, and so the original owners sell out to him in the late 1840s and Clark and Kirkwood managed the mill until uh, oh, about the middle of the 1860s when they sell it to Valentine Miller who then maintains the mill uh, and milling operations on the river until oh, about the 1890s or so, something in that neighborhood. I am not the world's authority on dates so uh, I'll let you uh, process that as you go. Here's one of the earliest maps of Clarksville. Gives whole new meaning to the monkey song, Last Train to Clarksville, right? And that uh, <laughs> wasn't that the, the title of that song. It was a visit from Louis Agassiz, and that's I think how it's pronounced, from Harvard University, one of the foremost fathers of modern geology, who took, because of course he's a visiting uh, professor and they wanted to show him the site, so I think they took him out to uh, not to, just to the dam, but to some of the rock formations in the area. And he said, well, this is a wonderful coral uh, reef from the Devonian age. And they were so impressed with his lecture uh, that uh, uh, Ezekiel Clark decided to change the name to Coralville. And I thought, well, many communities must have done that because the, the Devonian era and coral is, of course, a, a, a fairly fossilized coral, fairly common. As far as I can tell, there, is, or there are only two Coralvilles in the world. One is here, and I believe a second one is in France. I cannot find it, however. <laughs> I'm still searching for Coralville in France. So as far as I know, this may be the only Coralville in the world. Uh, so it's nice to have a name that nobody else has, so we can be proud of that. The city was legally incorporated in 1873, and as I say, right now I'm saying one of two in the, uh, in the, the, uh, the world. I want to point out the mills, I, there you go. You can see this, it's a little bit hard to see. This says woolen mill, paper mill, flour mill. There were multiple mills, and this is, of course, the corner of 2nd uh, 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 Street and 5th Avenue right there, uh, and that was, would have been the, where, Co where Coser's store is. We'll talk a little bit more about Coser's store, but this is the kind of nucleus of Coralville in its early days. But you can see, of course, Mr. Clark owned a large part of what we now think of as Coralville. 
Founders also represents, of course, the people. And it's more than Ezekiel Clark and Samuel Kirkwood. These are members of two families that had a major imprint on the city of Coralville, the Payton families and the Kozer families, who quite as expected, you might expect, there was some intermarriage. And of course, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think it's James Payton here, and then this is Edward Kozer and Harriet Payton. So uh, you have a father, of course, and then husband and, and so forth. Both uh, Payton and Kozer were mayors of Coralville. And in fact, Edward Kozer was mayor of Coralville for 33, 34 years, from about 1903 until, uh, until he passed away, I think, in 1935. An important figure, and again, represents the kind of volunteerism that goes into leading a community of this size. That's the kind of the first generation. I also uh, wanted to mention just in deference to my good friend Rex. Uh, these are his grandparents, uh, Genevieve and uh, Joseph Brandstetter, Brandy Brandstetter as he was known. Uh, she was the town clerk and he was the town marshal for many years. Uh, and they were very proud of the fact that they had the first telephone in Coralville Heights. Uh, and I'm sure it was well used. <laughs> <laughs> A second chapter is the river. And of course, quite obviously, as, as anyone who's lived in this area would tell you, the river is an important part not only of just Coralville's life, but virtually every community that lives along the edge of the river. So I wanted to make sure that we had a good representation of pictures of the river. And the river serves so many different functions. In this case, of course, you've got Coral Mill up here, which represents industry. And you've got one of the many uh, pleasure boats. This was taken, oh, turn of the 20th century, into the 20th century. Then you can see work, is, as I say, symbolized by the mill itself and then by the, by the boats. Excursion boats would, would go back and forth and, and uh, give people an opportunity to get some cool air or go on a picnic. Uh, and, uh, and it was, a, it was a, a regular industry during the summertime in the, in, the, in the warm months. So I wanted to make sure we had a picture of, of, uh, of that. And there are several others in the, in the uh, uh, book as well. And then, of course, the rage of the river. This is one of Rex's, or no, this is a, a Johnson County picture. Uh, flooding on the Iowa River. Um, and I th this, is, this is not, I'm trying to think of, I'm not sure I have a date on this one. But it, uh, it, it's, it's, before, it's well before 1993. So uh, uh, it's a, uh, again, the power of, of, of overwhelming uh, Coralville and, and the very fact, for example, that uh, uh, Second Avenue or Second Street was, uh, was first known as Water Street is the fact that it was so often covered with water. And of course, the Coralville Dam, the engineers versus Mother Nature. Uh, the Army Corps uh, built a dam on the Iowa River north of Coralville. It was completed in the mid-1950s. It did offer a measure of stability for several decades, uh, but then, of course, with flooding in 1993 and in 2008. Uh, this is a, uh, a copy of the brochure that was produced in the mid-1950s to educate the people of Coralville in the area what the dam uh, would look like, described, it showed pictures of, of the construction project and, and so forth. You can see here's the Iowa River and then Turkey Creek here. It's, it's almost like a Grant Wood type painting. It was too good not to scan the brochure and include it in the, uh, in the book. Third chapter is industry. Uh, of course, everybody has a place to go uh, to, to work uh, and, and industry has been always a, a, a big part of Coralville. And this is a wonderful picture. Again, this is the, the flour mill and then next to it is a uh, paper mill. Uh, the flour mill served uh, the needs of the region. It's, we shouldn't, uh, uh, at this point, fail to appreciate how important that flour mill was because it was an opportunity for Iowans to, to uh, get their, their uh, grain milled and, uh, and then it was obviously sold to people in, in Iowa City. Uh, that phrase, who wants bread, as soon as the, the mill became operational in 1844, this was the column or the, the headline in the, uh, uh, the Iowa City papers, because this was an opportunity to have freshly milled flour. It was again sold to, to Valentine Miller in the 1860s and kind of an anchor industry until uh, the, the, the uh, dam was sold to the uh, Iowa, R Iowa City Electric uh, Power Company. But it's more, Iowa Coralville's more than a mill. 
Uh, farming, of course, is a, is a big part of Coralville's economy. Uh, this is George Prohoda, who is an area farmer. Um, growing fruits and vegetables uh, and, and producing various dairy products that were sold in Iowa City was, was a, a, a big part of Coralville life back in the, well, all the way uh, through into the 1950s. So a lot of the land was originally in farm production. And of course, the, uh, this is the Iowa River Power Company, uh, which of course now is a restaurant. In the 1880s, the dam was sold to the city uh, Power and Light Company, and then the uh, plant itself uh, was constructed and operated until uh, well, about 1968 is, is the information I have. You can see this is, uh, I think, Flanagan's now, and uh, you can see the rest of the power company there. And of course, other, other forms of industry, harvesting stone, uh, the River Products Company started here in 1920, uh, limestone shipped via rails all over the country. It's considered very excellent limestone and uh, used uh, as a, uh, a building material. Commerce uh, is chapter four. Here's an early advertisement. I love the fact that this is the best in the world. No boasting here in Coralville. From grain to flour to bread, Coralville has been tied economically from the 1840s to the present. Uh, and this advertising card uh, from the Coral Mill, which uh, uh, marketed its products at a shop uh, on Dubuque Street. And for any of you who've lived here for any length of time, certainly before 1970, will remember Kozer's store. It was kind of an anchor store. You could get uh, what you needed at Kozer's uh, without having to go to Iowa City. Uh, the, it was kind of a community center where people swapped stories. They could get the news and they could certainly warm up. People used to stand inside the store waiting for the uh, Cran Dick to take them into uh, Iowa City. So it was, uh, and of course, because uh, Edward Kozer was the mayor, it was kind of the, the hub of, uh, of uh, Coralville activity for many of those decades. And then look how far we've come in the sense of, of explosion, expansion, dynamic center of commerce at the Coral Ridge Mall. It's opened in 1999. At the time, it was the largest shopping center in the state of Iowa. So we've come a long way since uh, you had to get what you needed at, at Kozer's store. Our fifth chapter is travel, because getting around has always been a challenge wherever you live, whether you're living in Iowa City or Coralville or any other part of Iowa. Dirt roads would often mean you get bogged down. And so uh, pavement or, or mechanisms to move around were always important. Uh, we started, of course, with, uh, with horses. This is uh, Raymond Cole, who lived uh, on 12th Street, uh, his horse and buggy. Traveled generally uh, until he got to the 1910s, was by foot and horse, uh, and, uh, and then some rail. And certainly the introduction of Crandick, the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City Railroad, which allowed people to come into and to back and forth to Iowa City was, was a real boon, because you could certainly work in Iowa City, get back and forth, trains ran every hour, uh, once an hour, and uh, the fare was 10 cents. Uh, and uh, the biggest year of transportation, I think, was in the mid-1940s. Uh, 400,000, uh, it's in the book, but 400 and some thousand uh, uh, rides uh, during that year. It was back, of course, when people were rationing gasoline, so it was a little easier to take the Crandick, or at least more efficient to take the Crandick. And then uh, the service ended about 1953, and of course, we do have a bus service that started in 1972, if I'm correct. And of course, family automobiles. We've always had lots of automobiles. These are the Wenmans. Uh, and of course, increased uh, uh, automobile traffic came partly as a result, too, of paved roads. Uh, the, um, I always like to tell people that in 1928, in November of 28, when Herbert Hoover won the presidency, the headline in the Iowa City Press Citizen, it did say Hoover elected, but above it, was the headline that said Iowa, vote for pay, Iowa votes for paved roads because uh, paved roads were more important than Herbert Hoover, at least back in 1928. So uh, the Wenmans had uh, 11 children and he, he worked for uh, Iowa River Products Company, I believe. Many of the, the founding families either worked at the mill or worked at the power uh, plant in the, in the, uh, the 20th century and then uh, beyond that uh, worked uh, for the university, sometimes farmed as well, did several jobs. Chapter six is governance. Uh, first City Hall was a multi-use building. Uh, in fact, it started out as the Union Ecclesiastical Church. 
which became Iowa's, uh, or came, excuse me, Coralville's first town hall from 1921 to 1974, and also importantly, because of this day, the first home of the library when uh, the women of Coralville uh, kind of set up in a corner, I think, in the basement, uh, and it grew from there. Uh, and the building, this building, First City Hall has been moved across the street from the Coralville, uh, from the, uh, uh, the 1876 schoolhouse. And this is the uh, current, the City Hall that was opened in 1974. Um, here's the City uh, Hall chamber about, oh, middle of the 1980s, I think, was this picture was taken. And Coralville saw, obviously, explosive growth after 1950. You have about uh, a thousand or 1,200 people, I think it is, in 1950, and it continues to grow exponentially after that date. Governance also means police and fire in some cases. You have an auxiliary police department as well as a paid police department, and you have a volunteer fire department that was formed in 1929. Uh, this particular fire at Econogas in 1964 was a, was a kind of cataclysmic event. Uh, and still remembered by people uh, in this community. Uh, and Coralville, of course, is the home of the, uh, the Iowa Firefighter Memorial. Uh, so we do have pictures of the memorial as well, but this is a particularly iconic picture and of course came from Rex. I think he has it, it's one of the pictures he has up in his office. Governance also means, uh, and I suppose I'm a little embarrassed, I didn't know Kelly was gonna be here, but this is a great picture because it represents a kind of culmination of collaboration between uh, volunteerism and, and city governance uh, and, and looking for economic opportunity when it's presented. And this is, of course, the opening of the, the Marriott uh, Hotel and Convention Center at Iowa River Landing in 2006. And uh, in fact, uh, Coralville kind of shifts to a city manager or city administrator uh, uh, plus mayor and city council governance in 1988, I believe it is. Uh, and, and so uh, it, it's certainly been an important part of, of the, the, the quality of leadership that we've had and the, the dynamism we've seen in this community going forward. Education is chapter seven. This is the earliest picture of school days in Coralville from the turn of the 20th century, probably taken about 1900. This is the 1876 schoolhouse. Uh, I think all of these kids are a little terrified of having their picture taken. And of course, education continued to grow throughout Coralville. This is uh, the uh, Northwest Junior High. Uh, the 1876 schoolhouse was closed uh, in about, oh, I think the last class was 1949. Coralville Central was opened in 1950, Kirkwood Elementary in 64, and then the Junior High in 72, and of course, on and on after that point. Education also includes personal education, collective education. This is the kind of the earliest uh, efforts at, uh, I think this picture was, was of the uh, redecoration of the Fessler building. So this goes back to uh, the, oh, I think it was the 1970s, right? It may, well, I don't think this is the basement of the, of the, the uh, City Hall. This is, this is, I think, Fessler. Uh, bake Sale was sponsored by the Girl Scouts in April of 65, was the first uh, event in a fundraising campaign that supported the establishment of the library. And here, it was, it was moms and volunteers. It's kind of very fitting that it's always been volunteers who've kind of stepped forward uh, and, uh, and, and redid the, uh, the, the Fessler building uh, as a library. Um, Fessler was one of the early mayor, I think he was an early mayor of, of Coralville, and he uh, sold his building. I think half of the building was for the recreation department, and the other half was for the public library. Education has also include the 1876 schoolhouse, which has been used for, again, a variety of purposes. Uh, this is the rededication at the time it became the Johnson County Historic Society. And the building has many uses. It's a school, it's been a gymnasium, uh, auditorium, teen center, warehouse, and now an historic site. Uh, it's unusual because it's a brick structure and it's two stories. Rex tells me there are very few two-story schoolhouses in Iowa, so it's a real testament to the commitment that the people of Coralville made and to the, to the whole idea of, of having a schoolhouse here. Recreations, chapter eight. This is a great picture from the Chris family, informal baseball game, probably taken in the 1920s. One of the challenges of doing a book like this, of course, as I alluded to before, is in many cases you get a great picture, 
but you don't know where it was taken and you don't know who's in the picture. Otherwise, it's great. Uh, and so I really want to add another admonition. Please put identifying information on the back in pencil if you can, lightly. Please don't write so hard that your handwriting comes through on the other side. Or put it in with a, with a slip of paper in an envelope. I mentioned earlier the, the, the uh, process of, of boat rides, uh, and there were several folks who, who uh, ran these services. The Alwine family, for example, was, I know, one of them. Uh, and there was a place called Picnic Hollow. I'm not sure where that is. Uh, you're all too young to know where Picnic Hollow was. If it, uh, in fact, it must have been uh, a, a place where people could go for a, for a picnic afternoon. But this particular picture said, uh, I think it said, excursion to Picnic Hollow, wherever that was. So I added it into the caption. Turn of the 20th century. Other forms of recreation. This is the notorious Iowa City Drive-In Theater. Some of you are probably old enough to remember the Iowa City Drive-In Theater, which of course, and, the, and the, the notoriety starts with its name. Of course, it wasn't located in Iowa City, but the, but the, uh, the, the people who constructed it said no one know, will know where Coralville is, so we'll call it the Iowa City Drive-In Theater, even though it's located in, uh, in Coralville. And then, of course, it became even more controversial when it began to show softcore pornography on screens that allowed uh, uh, young men and others to, uh, to kind of look over the fence and uh, see things they probably shouldn't see. So uh, my understanding is that sort of was the beginning of the end for the Iowa, notorious Iowa City Drive-In Theater. But this is the very beginning of it right there. Hospitality has been a big part of, of Coralville's uh, identity here. And it really starts with the uh, Mormon hand carts constructed in the summers of 1856 and 57 when they settled on the banks of, of uh, Clear Creek. They camped in Coralville before they moved on to Utah. And it was just those two summers, but it was kind of symbolic of their, uh, the, the, the fact that they were welcomed here in Coralville from a very early age of, or in the development of the city. Uh, and of course, everyone remembers the blue tops, and I wanted to make sure we included some pictures and thanks to uh, Lois uh, Finke and uh, Larry and Judy Smith, who have a wonderful collection of, of pictures uh, over the years and, and particularly uh, in the last few years. So uh, we wanted to make sure we included that among the, the many pictures of hotels and motels. Now there's something of a downside, I suppose, to development is that you don't always control signage. Uh, I'm not sure any of these uh, facilities are, are uh, uh, this is this is a long. Are any of these still? I don't think carousel. any. It's carousel. Well, carousel. The carousel is there, but the carousel is gone, right? There's nothing. I don't think any of these are left. This is uh, sec, uh, uh, Second Street. Reasonable. They still have reasonable rates there at uh, the Super Inn. <laughs> service. I want to mention service. Folks in Coralville have always been joiners. They've contributed to the welfare of others without question. In this case, I wanted to include Elizabeth Fellows, and this is Elizabeth there. Uh, this is the Iowa City Soldiers Aid Society uh, for the Civil War, and she worked in, in various civic organizations up until the time of the First World War. So uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, Fellows uh, Dennis uh, was, uh, was a, a real active volunteer, and I wanted to make sure she was included in the book. And these are the Dinsmores. Uh, about to ship off in World War II, uh, and they contributed the land, which is now the American Legion headquarters in Coralville. 82 Coralvillians uh, served in World War II and in the Korean conflict. I don't know the specific breakdown. I think they are uh, on, the, on the, uh, the war memorial here. So I wanted to make sure we, of course, acknowledged our men in service. Girl Scouts were first organized uh, in 1944 here, and there's a Brownie troop uh, the Boy Scouts, I think, go back to the, to the 1920s, and here they present a check to the uh, Historical Society, and as I mentioned, their bake sale was uh, responsible for the, for, for the uh, beginning of the public library. <coughs> and of course, the Firefighters Memorial, which I mentioned earlier, Coralville's Fire Department was founded in 1929. Celebration is our last chapter. This is probably the very first evidence of Fourth Fest, Terry. There you go. This is your Fourth. <laughs> it's and I, and I date this because of the American flag. This is the uh, the Hemphill home, taken on the Fourth of July, 1899. 
a uh, family picture. People come, would come home to Coralville, and there are several pictures of Christmas time and of, of uh, summertime when families would get together for various celebrations. And I certainly wanted to make sure that we, we acknowledge the very first Fourth Fest. This is a wonderful picture because it represents not only uh, the parade, which uh, now takes place uh, every year at Fourth Fest, but really the contributions of three extraordinary women, Jean Schaub, Pauline Loftinsky, and Fran Rogers, for, in this case, 75 years of service. The picture was taken in the mid-1990s. I'm not sure somebody in the library staff took it, and uh, fortunately, Allison can put her hands on it, and I was able to scan it and add it to the book because they're a big part of what made this library what it is today, uh, and also because the people of Coralville appreciate that and, and had them participate in the parade. So it was nice to have them represented in the picture, also as a member of the parade. Celebrating, uh, of course, Isles of, Isle of Light and celebrating at Christmas time. You all know the Bonson home. Uh, and of course, with all of the various Santas, and, and there they are uh, in, in all the splendor. I'm not sure Dave knows how many Santas he has, but I wonder if they talk to him. You know, that would be the real question. <laughs> And Fry Fest, I want to make mention of Fry Fest, uh, annual celebration. I think this is from the very first one. I think this, this is uh, Jim Fawcett uh, talking. There's Hayden, and uh, of course, uh, Herky's there. I'm not sure who else is up there on the stage with him, but uh, Fry Fest, of course, continues now each year before the first football game. Okay, where to find the book? Well, we, you can find the book right back there with Laura, right? There's Laura, that's right. Now, should you be unable to make it to the back of the table, or be without funds. Uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau has pictures. I mean, this shows you the depth. I said to somebody, I've, I've done 20 books, and I've never had a salesman go from store to store trying to sell my book. Uh, but Arcadia, I'm told, printed 1,200 copies. And by gosh, they're going to make sure they sell one to as many Coralville people as they possibly can. Uh, but first, you buy the books here. And then if you need more, you can go to Barnes & Noble, or to Walgreens, or to Ace Hardware, or to Hy-Vee, or if you have to, you can buy it at Prairie Lights. <laughs> okay, what's next? I mentioned we're building an online database of historic Coralville photographs, so those boxes in the basement, or in the attic, or on a shelf someplace, or that your mother or father gave you and you haven't opened for a while and you think you might be able to identify them, let's get them in. Uh, I've got some cards I can give you with my phone number on them. We can make sure you can, uh, we want to make sure though that when you bring photos in, what, what Allison doesn't need are abandoned orphans on the, the doorstep of the library in the middle of the night <laughs> with people running away. Uh, with pictures without ownership, we want to make sure that if you're going to give them uh, to the Historical Society, which is where the pictures would go, uh, with Alex's permission, you know, I, I saw a moment of panic cross her face. <laughs> How many pictures are we talking about? How much space is this going to take? But we want to make sure that, that there's an orderly process. So we, wanna, we want to build up the database, and we hope to be able to then put this online, make it available so folks can have access to these historic pictures and use them as needed. Uh, we're, so we're continuing to search. We want to raise awareness of, always of the importance of Coralville history. Uh, and I, we're developing a bike tour of historic Coralville. I'm happy to see Gary Frost, my colleague from uh, the book program over at the University of Iowa, who is organizing the, bus, or the, the bike tour. Uh, hopefully it's not a bus tour. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, a bicycle tour of historic Coralville. We've got a map. We're going to use a few of the pictures. We're going to put this together. We hope to have this available when, Gary? Well, by Rag <laughs> By Rag Brian. okay. And we hope to make this brochure available at various locations in the area, Convention and Visitors Bureau and elsewhere, so that folks want to get a little exercise, a little history at the same time, they can do it on the bike tour. Planning for the sesquicentennial, I mentioned that, 2023. And we want to make sure that you continue to support the Public Library and the Johnson County Historical Society. If you are not uh, a, a member of the, uh, the Historical Society, please sign up. It's important for us to continue the Coralville spirit of supporting uh, the, the Historical Society as well as the Public Library. And I believe that's it. Thank you for paying attention to me. As <laughs> if, if you have questions, I can certainly take questions. Um, I don't necessarily have all the answers, but, but I'll dodge and weave and, uh, and pretend that I do or tell you that you have to see Rex Brandstetter 
for all your history needs, so something like that. So. Okay, well folks, thanks so much again for coming and for uh, uh, setting aside the opportunity to watch the NCAA or Dancing with the Stars or <laughs> just staying at home. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be happy to sign books if you'd like them signed.